So we've covered essentially one type of innate immunity, and that is the first line of defense. And now we're going to talk about the second line of defense, which gets uh, a bit more complicated. And so uh, it, the second line of defense uh, includes mainly cells and what they do. So there's cells, there's the complement system, there's interferons, and what we get to do is we get to tie all this together and look at it in the context of inflammation. Now, one thing you're going to see when we talk about this is that phagocytosis we're talking about in this particular slide set which is the second line of defense, but we also talked about phagocytosis in the first line of defense. As far as I'm concerned, whichever one you want to consider it, that's fine. Phagocytosis, though, the topic, as you will see, we'll get into it, is super important. So let's go ahead and dive into this slide set now and get into some of the nuts and bolts of our second line of defense. So let's orient ourselves on this particular slide. So we're looking inside uh, a blood vessel. And of course, we've got red blood cells. We've got platelets, which are really important for the uh, second line of defense. We'll talk about that during the inflammation section at the end of this lecture slide set. And then what we've got here are the leukocytes, which are all these cells here. Okay, so what we're not going to talk about right now are lymphocytes. And the reason being is because they're part of adaptive immunity. And what we're talking about right now is innate immunity, specifically the second line of defense. And so basophils are involved in inflammation. They release histamine, which we'll talk about in the context of inflammation. And then we've got these cells which can phagocytose. We've got neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes. And monocytes, I like to think of as the Bruce Banner, who then transform into the Hulk in the form of macrophage. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Okay, so let's look at these leukocytes in more depth. And so what we have here are some micrographs of leukocytes in the bloodstream. Each of these percentages is the approximate percentage in your bloodstream when you are not infected with anything. So that's the natural percentage. Okay, so, so basophils are uh, mainly involved in inflammation. Neutrophils and eosinophils, which is right here and right here, uh, both of them can phagocytose yeast, bacteria, other types of microbes, and debris. Okay, so, and they're capable of diapodesis, which means that they can squeeze out of your blood vessels in times of inflammation and into an area that needs uh, taken care of in terms of phagocytosing invaders. Okay. So monocytes can turn into macrophage, and macrophage uh, are phagocytes as well. So in other words, neutrophils, eosinophils and monocytes are all phagocytes, but monocytes only are phagocytes after they become macrophage, so like turn into the Incredible Hulk and just being able to devour all kinds of things. Now, this blood panel here, for example, uh, if you were to get increased eosinophils, then that indicates two things. Either somebody is undergoing allergies or they've got a parasitic worm infection. So mainly in the United States, if somebody has increased eosinophils, it is due to an allergic reaction uh, because unless they came from uh, some type of third world country where parasitic worms are more common, normally we just don't see that. Now, of course, there are certainly people in the United States that do have parasitic worm infections that are indicated by eosinophils, uh, but most of the time they're due to allergies. Okay, so bacterial diseases causes an increase in the number of all the leukocytes. So the leukocyte count, right, for all of these combined increases, okay? That's because they are clearing out an infection. And the percent neutrophils. So neutrophils, boy, these are potent, powerful, really key players. They are often called the first responders. And so if we look at this right now, neutrophils are the majority of the leukocytes in your bloodstream. And that hearkens to their, their, their prevalence really demonstrates how important they are, okay? So uh, there are a variety of things that neutrophils can do, which we will cover. What is the one thing we've just talked about that neutrophils can do? So look on the slide. That's right, they are phagocytes, okay? So, uh, and then viral infections show increase in lymphocytes, which are mainly involved in adaptive immunity. So we will talk about that uh, later. You do not need to know 
the percentages here, but you do need to know that neutrophils are the majority and they will actually also increase in percentage when infected with bacteria. So let's talk about phagocytosis. We know that neutrophils, eosinophils, and macrophage are all phagocytes. We know that phagocytes mean that they are actually eating some type of pathogen. So what does that mean to eat a pathogen when you're a cell? So what we're looking at here in this particular slide are six stages of this particular process. And so what we're seeing in this particular area, the reason why it looks so different, is we're looking at a transmission electron micrograph to show us that yes, this overall picture that we're seeing over here, right, there is basis of reality in that. And so what this is showing us is each one of these, right, this right here, here, these are Neisseria bacteria, okay? And so uh, Neisseria, does that ring a bell? All right, that's, this, that's the genus for the species, for example, that causes gonorrhea. And so what happens then is these pseudopods, right, will grab, it's about to grab this particular cell right here and then take it into the cell. And that's what we're seeing right there. So the phagocyte has ingested the microbe. Then what it does is it seals off this area up here so it encapsulates it and that's called a phagosome. Now also in the cell are these lysosomes. Lysosomes are internal structures that secrete from the Golgi body and they've got a lot of enzymes inside of there. And so these enzymes will degrade the bacteria that it ingested. Okay? So what we need then is we need this lysosome to fuse up with this phagolysosome, with this phagosome right there, creating the phagolysosome. Okay? So then what happens is all of these different enzymes start attacking this bacteria. It gets acidic in there. Other chemicals will essentially break this up into bits, and that's what we're seeing here, and here, and here, and here, and here. These are bits of the bacteria to the point where there are just small fragments, and what is left over is released. Now, how do you go from something this big to a bunch of small fragments and have it just be a little bit? Well, a lot of these molecules which are being released from digesting, just like you digest, it's the same general idea, enzymes and chemicals are breaking it down, those are nutrients, and so those nutrients essentially are used by the phagolysosome to operate, and some of the nutrients are then released into the cell, the, phag the phagocyte itself, and that's where it's getting its nutrition. So the general notion that what we're seeing is actually eating, right, and digestion, there really is a good correlation with how you eat, because you bring in food, it then interacts with chemicals and enzymes. It degrades it into smaller molecules, which then goes into the cell. And what is not digested is excreted. So instead of releasing feces, uh, we just call this elimination. But it is this generally the same notion. Okay? So these six stages, that is, first, the phagocyte goes to right, chemotaxis, it senses the bacteria, so it physically moves toward the bacteria. Once it's there, it binds to it, so it adheres. It ingests, it fuses the phagosome with the lysosome to create the phagolysosome. It destroys the microbes by enzymes and other chemicals and uses these nutrients, and then there is exocytosis which is the elimination of the uh, non-digestive material. And so this yeast up here is essentially going to get just tore up and dig digested. And obviously, this isn't always to scale. Yeast are big eukaryotic cells compared to Neisseria gonorrhea, which is a small bacterial cell. And uh, it is specifically showing this is as a diplococcus. So hopefully you remember that, right? And so that's what Neisseria gonorrhea is, a diplococcus. So that is phagocytosis. Know it well. And so where are these phagocytes? Well, you know, kind of where are they not? 
You know, some of my favorite ones are these microglial cells. And these microglial cells are in the brain. And it's really crazy because what one thing that they do is if you look at my hands, they go ahead and they, if this is a nerve cell, right, nerve cells can be really, really long, an insulated nerve cell, these microglial cells, which are phagocytes, actually bind to the outside of them and they move along it. And when they come across a microbe, they then engulf it and then undergo the six steps of phagocytosis. And then we're done with that. They can keep moving along other for microbes. So think about our, our nerve cells in our brain and these, our own microglial phagocytes just moving along. And wherever there's something that shouldn't be there, it takes it, pulls it in, and degrades it. Right? Super fascinating. And so that's just one example in the brain that you've got these, these, these wandering macrophage, and that's, that's, there's two types of general types of macrophage. There's wandering, they move around, they physically look, and there's others that are fixed, right? Like they're in the lymph tissue, for example, and when the microbes come to them, they're there, they're waiting, and the buffet happens, and then they just start attacking. The, it's kind of like an ambush, right? So the fixed ones are like, an, like ambush phagocytes, and the wandering ones, they're like the army that's moving around, always looking for the enemy to degrade it. Okay. All right, so let's get back to this slide set. So then uh, here, example, the macrophage and the lymph nodes, those are, for example, in the, uh, those are the fixed, for example. And so basically, you don't need to know all of these, but they're, I mean, they're in your lungs, they're in your spleen, they're in your kidneys, they're in all your organs, they are kind of everywhere. And that's the key thing to know. Although, know the microglial ones, because they're cool. OK, so, so let's now kind of turn the page and go from phagocytic killing, which is very important, to our non-phagocytic phagocytic killing. OK, so, so eosinophils, which are also phagocytes, they um, also secrete toxins. OK, and they respond to parasitic helminths. So parasites, right, one of the types of pathogens. So flukes, roundworms, tapeworms, they, they sense them, they attach to the surface, and then think about it. What they do is, is quite remarkable. They, let's see here, let's get this pen out. If this, for example, is, you know, the worm, nothing, nothing is to scale, then the eosinophil will bind to it, they will sense it, and then they will secrete toxins which will bind to the surface of the parasitic, of the parasite, uh, and that will get in and that will weaken or kill this. And so degrading it like that. Okay, so as I mentioned before, elevated eosinophils uh, is often indicative of a helminth infestation unless it's allergies. Okay, so then neutrophils, they're the first responders. And so one thing to remember about that will, that makes sense is that they are typically 60 to 70% of your white blood cells, right? And check this out, they produce bleach, right? We know that bleach kills. We use bleach in the lab to kill the microbes we're working with. And so here you can think of a neutrophil, drawing it here, I'll throw in a nucleus, why not? Uh, this should have had a nucleus as well, okay? So this will secrete a lot of bleach molecules, and so that if there's a bacteria next, nearby it, it will oxidize it and it will kill it as well. The other thing that uh, neutrophils can do, which is really crazy, is for example, if this is the neutrophil, and here is the nucleus, okay, and it comes across, say it recognizes that, and I'm just drawing a bacterium here, all right, that's my poor looking bacterium, so it recognizes and senses this bacterium. So one thing it does is it disintegrates its nucleus so that the nucleus is disintegrated and the DNA that was bound in the nucleus is now out and it starts forming this weird net thing, okay? And in this net thing are these antimicrobial peptides. So then what happens is essentially the cell undergoes, uh, well, it undergoes suicide. So it degrades itself so that the next step is essentially the cell is no longer there and what we have is this net, neutrophil extracellular trap. And in it are 
these different types of antimicrobial peptides, okay, and this is big, remember a, a, a human cell is a lot bigger, so that basically what can happen is this net right here will then go over this bacterium and it will, I should use a different color, it will cover it with the net and it will push all of these antimicrobial peptides into the bacterium and it will destroy the bacterium. Okay, so that's what this net does. Neutrophil, extracellular, because it got out of the cell, and it's a trap. It's like a net. So if we look at my hands for a moment, what we're talking about essentially is we've got this bacterium, and we've got our, our neutrophil, which has gone, undergone internal components and degrades itself, but in the process it produces this net, and embedded in this net are a whole bunch of toxic peptides so that it can actually then, it's like throwing a net on something, you've caught it, but now what happens is the net is on it and it's pushing in the toxins and this dies and degrades. And so that's an awesome way for neutrophils. Think about neutrophils. So far, neutrophils, we know they can uh, phagocytose. So they can sense a bacterium and they can engulf them or a yeast. If they don't do that, maybe what they'll do is instead, they'll produce a bunch of bleach and they're producing all this chemical which will then degrade and oxidize the pathogen. And then after all that's done, what they may choose to do, yeah, choose, I don't know about that, but they respond to the environment, they then undergo uh, the suicide, so it's part of the suicide squad, right? And they produce these, these neutrophil extracellular traps, which then essentially is a net, so it's kind of like the dying thing. And so think about it, There's, there, most of the white blood cells are neutrophils, and so don't just think about one, one neutrophil there doing one thing to one bacteria. Think about a site of infection where there's a bunch of bacteria, we'll say, uh, and there's a whole bunch of neutrophils. Some of them are just pumping out bleach and destroying bacteria. Others are undergoing suicide and throwing out these nets, right, with these, these toxins in it, which will then degrade. And others are going around and they are physically, right, chemotaxis to the bacterium or the yeast, adhering, right, ingesting, making a phagolysosome, degrading, and then eliminating. So all of that is happening from a bunch of different uh, neutrophils at once. And so neutrophils being called the first responders, we can see why, right? So let's go ahead and get back to the slide set. And so the last thing that I'll mention right now is these natural killer lymphocytes. And for the purpose of this class, I'm not worried about that. If you come across it in your reading, certainly read about it and it's interesting, but I'm not gonna worry about talking about it on this slide. Okay, so. Uh, so let's talk about nonspecific chemical defense and in particular the complement pathway. And so these are proteins. So they're designated numerically C1, C2, C3. Don't worry about that. Don't, I'm not going to ask you about any of the numbers. Okay? The key thing to know is how they are activated and how they end up killing pathogens. Okay, so how are they activated? There are three ways of activation. There's the classical pathway, and the classical pathway is shown over here, and that is where antibodies that you make are binding to antigens and then activate. Right? And that's what we're looking at right down here. You make the antibody and it binds to a microbe's antigen. Number two is the alternate pathway, which essentially relies on factors binding to external proteins and toxins. And so that is this one right here. And then the third one is uh, binding to the polysaccharides that are on the outside of the pathogen. And so these polysaccharides then are bound by lectins, and that is the third one right here. Okay, so now we know that they're activated. So in other words, your body has antibodies, it has factors, and it has lectins, and if they bump into a particular pathogen that has a complementary binding site, such as mannose and lectones, such as glycoproteins, for the factors and such as antigens for the antibodies, either one of these steps 
will then activate the complement cascade. And that's what we're talking about, activation. So what we just talked about is activation in three different ways, classical, alternate, and lectin. And that's summarized down here as well. And so then once we activate it, we have inflammation and we've got the membrane attack complex and cell lysis. And that's what we're talking about up here. Okay. So let's look at this a little bit. Ah, I know one thing I wanted to put. This much more effective against gram-negative bacteria. Okay, so why is that? Well, think about it. Gram-positive bacteria, as we've talked about, has this very thick peptidoglycan wall, whereas gram-negative bacteria has a thinner peptidoglycan wall, but then on the outside, it's got the outer membrane, and that is the key. So the outer membrane layer of the gram-negative bacteria is where the majority of the membrane attack complexes form. In other words, this system, the complement, is going to punch holes, big, big holes in this, okay? And when it does that, okay, so it will form big holes in the membrane. And when it does that, basically what we're going to see is that a whole bunch of water is going to start flooding into the cell unchecked and essentially this cell will then undergo osmotic lysis and so this will then degrade it as opposed to the membrane attack complexes for gram positive it can't form holes in the peptidoglycan it somehow would have to get through all of that and then degrade down here and sometimes it does happen but complement by and large gram negative is key complement Membrane attack complexes, which are these holes right here, gram negative because they have the outer membrane. So let's look at this complicated pathway. This, what we're looking at here is a pathogen, and see all of the dark circles here? That is showing us these particular membrane attack complexes. So this is actually, right, a transmission electron microscope. And so what we have then is actually seeing the holes. So we know that this is actually rooted in reality. And if we look at what happened, basically what we have are these C proteins, don't worry about the numbers, that formed this pore, this membrane attack complex. Okay, so how did we get to the point where your body has made all of these holes in this pathogen? Well, remember, we're talking about the complement cascade, and what's the first part of the complement cascade? Right? Go back to this. What is the first part? Activation. Okay? So activation is happening right here. So this is the activation. And this particular example is an antibody binding to an antigen. And so that is what type? Right? Is it the classical? Is it the alternate? Or is it the lectin pathway? Well, it's antibody. So if we look down here, Antibody and antigen, that's classical. If we look down here, antibody and antigen, that is called the classical pathway. So what we're looking at is the activation in this particular diagram of the complement cascade by the classical pathway, and we see that because it is an antibody binding to an antigen. However, regardless of how it's activated, all of the rest of this is the same exact thing. Right, so the outcome is the same. So check this out. Once it's activated, one of the complement proteins, okay, splits, boom, boom, starts breaking apart other complement proteins into their pieces. So look at how C2 now became C2A and C2B. C4 became C4A and C4B, right? C4A and C4B. And this is really crazy because now a piece of this complement protein will bind to a piece of the other complement protein and make a brand new enzyme that wasn't there before that can then, check this out, break, whoops, break these other complement proteins into pieces. So basically we have complement proteins breaking other complement proteins. Pieces of those complement proteins will form other enzymes to break other complement proteins. And then basically what you're left with is a bunch of fragments of these proteins which do different things. 
So this right now is the key thing. This opsonin means that it will mark a pathogen for destruction. It, C3A will cause chemotaxis and inflammation. So let's just take a look at uh, over here. So we know that we've got a bunch of new things being made. C3A and C5A, these are pieces which if we look over here, look what's happening. This is a, for example, a basophil. I told you we would get back to that. And so this is a basophil, which essentially is releasing inflammatory molecules like histamine. So why did the basophil start releasing histamine? Well, the reason being that it was activated by C3A and C5A. Where did those come from? Well, they came from over here being cleaved. Why were they cleaved? Because complement was activated. In other words, since an antibody bond to an antigen, that is a cue to your immune system that, hey, we have pathogens, we need inflammation. And so when this breaks up these pieces into here, some of these, you don't need to know the numbers, some of these complement proteins will stimulate inflammation by binding to basophil. That's a story I want you to know. Fragments of complement proteins bind to basophils, activating them to release histamines, which will stimulate inflammation. The other thing this does is different components will then bind to the pathogen and make these pores, these membrane attack complexes, which I drew here. So the red circles here are the same thing as this over here. And now water is going to go and flood into the cell. And essentially, this whole thing is going to blow up. Okay, It's too much for it. So what do I want you to know about this slide? I want you to know how it's activated. I then want you to know that once it's activated, complement proteins will cleave other complement proteins, breaking them apart some of them forming new enzymes which will break other complement proteins apart. And then I want you to know that some of the fragments will essentially act as an opsonin, marking it for destruction. In other words, telling a phagocyte to bind. And so we'll just write here, right? So opsonin stimulates phagocytosis. And then uh, some of these complement proteins will make the membrane attack complex. And you know, when I was growing up, there were these, there were these McDonald's uh, commercials, which people during the middle of the day would all of a sudden have a Big Mac attack, right, for their Big Mac. And so whenever I think about complement ca cascade, I always think about Big Mac attack because it's making these big membrane attack complexes, right? And anyway, it's just a way that I have found to enjoy thinking about the complement cascade. So enjoy the complement cascade, and you're very much better off with it. So a complement cascade, where is this happening? This is happening in the bloodstream. That's where a lot of the complement happens. Okay, so now, these will kill pathogenic cells. So what about viruses? Okay, so we know that viruses infect your own cells, right? And what cells do they bind? They can bind a lot, but uh, when monocytes, macrophage, some lymphocytes, some fibroblasts, activated T cells, natural killer cells are infected, they will secrete interferons. You do not need to know the list of cells here. I just figured I'd put a name and a face on them. Just know that when viruses infect cells, some of them will produce interferons, okay? What is the purpose of interferons? This is it right here. To inhibit the spread of viral infections. How do they do it? By activating antiviral proteins. And one thing that they do is they protect other cells. They're more effective at a higher than normal body temperature. This is important because when you have a fever, that fever is helping interferons work more, okay? So uh, whether you've got influenza, you know, if you have like flu-type symptoms, 
Well, why do you get that? A lot of these, check it out, muscle aches, chills, headaches, fever actually come from the interferons. It's just a byproduct, okay? So, so when you have a fever from being uh, infected, think to yourself, ah, yes, my interferons are active, other parts of my inflammatory system are active, this fever is helping me clear out this infection, okay? So let's look at how this works. So this cell is your cell, the host cell. It has been infected by a virus, and as we know, when your cells are infected by a virus, their genome goes into the nucleus. And we also know that viruses hijack the host cell to make viral proteins, et cetera. And so when this happens in certain cells that we talked about, basically this cell says, uh-oh, we better produce interferons. Okay, it doesn't say that, but it, it responds by producing interferons. What happens then is interferons are released into the environment in a nearby cell, so this is a different cell. So this is one cell right here. This is another cell that's close by. So when this starts releasing these interferons, this cell right here is gonna respond because it has receptors which will bind to the interferons and when that receptor is bound, it sends a series of signals, which we don't need to get into, which then activates the production of inactive antiviral proteins, which is right here. Okay, so what just happened? A cell got infected by a virus. It responded by producing interferons. The interferons were released out of the cell, and a nearby cell picked them up. They brought it in. It activated the production of inactive antiviral proteins. Okay, so now time passes. Okay, so let's just say 24 hours has passed for this particular cell. So in this case, 24 hours later, this cell is uh, releasing lots of viruses and it is dying through the mechanisms that we talked about when viruses infect cells. So there's no hope for this cell. This cell essentially uh, was infected and so it is a goner. Nothing can be done about that. Okay, oh well, sorry, you got infected, you're dead. However, let's look at this neighboring cell right here. What did it do? It produced inactive antiviral proteins. So if this cell never gets infected by a virus, there's no worries, these inactive antiviral proteins will just end up getting degraded. However, if for example, a nearby cell releases viruses and infects this, ah, this cell is in a kingpin status because what it has is these inactive antiviral proteins are then activated. So the cell responds, it has mechanisms to say, uh-oh, we've been infected by a virus, right? And that shouldn't be surprised because that's what this cell did. This cell said, uh-oh, we've been infected by a virus, let's make antiviral proteins. This one right here, excuse me, let's make interferons. This cell right here has been infected, and so what happens is the inactive antiviral proteins become active. And what these do is these essentially bind to ribosomes and inhibit them, and they degrade messenger RNA, which means that this cell is not gonna make any proteins for three to four days. So what does that mean? Well, it gives the cell time, so if another virus infects, the cell, the virus cannot produce the proteins that are in the, in the cell, okay? So if, if we look at my hands, here's a cell that's been infected with the virus. So if we look inside, normally a virus, right, needs to essentially uh, have its copies of its genome made, right? So if it does that, it needs proteins to make that, and then to make the capsid, remember the capsid is on the outside, and there's other proteins, in the case of influenza, hemagglutinin, neuraminidase, et cetera, those proteins need to be made. So if the cell is not making any proteins at all, it shut down the whole protein synthesis factory system, then a virus can infect, but nothing's gonna happen. There are proteases around inside the cell which can then degrade the virus. There are nucleases which will degrade the genome. And so during that three to four day period, if a virus gets in, it will be degraded and it will not produce any new viruses. So that three to four kind of cooling out period for the cell not making any type of uh, proteins means that the viruses will not reproduce. And that is the key thing here. So in other words, that cell 
which was protected because this cell got infected, it produced interferons, which then bound to this, and this produced inactive antiviral proteins. Well, this one ended up dying. Okay, oh well, you were infected, you died. But now this is, is just waiting. If a virus goes into it, it cannot reproduce, it cannot reproduce, it cannot reproduce. During the three to four days, the rest of your immune system is going through clearing out a whole bunch of viruses through processes we'll talk about in the adaptive immunity section, clearing out viruses, and then essentially when this cell kind of wakes up, when the active viral proteins are degraded and it is now synthesizing proteins again, ideally there's no other viruses that can infect it. So basically, it produced, it turned that cell into a stronghold that can't be infected. And if a cell can't be infected, well, excuse me, it was infected, but what did it not do? It did not produce other viruses, that's key. So basically, interferons help other cells shore itself up and essentially not become viral producing factories. And if you don't produce viruses, that cuts off the ability to infect new cells. So I want to give you an example of hepatitis C in this next slide. And so let's look at that. And let's see how this is then different. Hepatitis C produces a protease that produces interferon from being produced. In other words, this step right here, if this is a hepatitis C virus that gets in, when interferon is not going to be produced because of protease, which is a type of enzyme, will stop it, which means that interferons will never leave, which means that this cell will never be protected, which means that when this comes out, it will go in and there's no antiviral proteins in there. And so in the hepatitis C, for example, its evolution means that it has now killed this cell. It has then produced these viruses, which can infect other cells. And since there's no antiviral proteins in this particular example, because we're talking about hepatitis C, this cell ends up becoming infected. And not only infected, but it produces other viruses, which can then go out and make more and more and more and more and more. And so that's how some viruses, for example, like hepatitis C and others, outwit our interferon system. And that's why some viruses are longer lasting. And we know that hepatitis C uh, is a chronic infection. You can have it for your entire life. And that's because it's really hard to keep that virus down when it prevents the interferons from being produced. So a little bit of interesting thing about hepatitis C. Okay, so let's tie some of this all together in the context of inflammation. So we're still in nonspecific response. And the things that can cause inflammation are essentially here. Right? So what we're looking at are chemicals, heat, cuts, impact, and pathogens. So if you get hit really hard and you have a bruise, it will get inflamed. If you get a cut, it will get inflamed. Heat will cause inflammation, right? That's what a burn is. Chemicals can cause inflammation. You can get chemical, if it's on your skin and it starts degrading it, you will get inflamed. So it's very much a nonspecific response, right? We know that inflammation is, is, is characterized by redness, heat, swelling, and pain. What we'll see is that the redness is caused by swelling and the, uh, the uh, what's the word, dilation of your blood vessels, which makes them closer to the surface of your skin, so it's red, okay? Heat are from pyrogens, which we'll talk about, and pain is caused from swelling pushing against your nerves, and that's why we have pain from inflammation. And so long-lasting inflammation, uh, you know, is a disease. So chronic, low-level inflammation, there's more and more studies showing that a lot of people are part of this. But what we're talking about are diseases. We're talking about acute. So for the purpose of this class, this is what we're talking about. And so basically what we're going to talk about is what we have on this slide. So first of all, we know that when complement is activated, it will then activate basophils to release histamines. There are other uh, inflammatory responses, such as prostaglandins, leukotrienes, which are very interesting. But for the purpose of this class, let's just stick with histamine okay? um, and anti-inflammatories. And so this will, uh, excuse me, not anti-inflammatories. Histamine is an inflammatory molecule. I misspoke there. Okay? So histamine, after the complement occurs, histamine is released. So histamine will bind 
to capillaries, which is what we're looking at here. And if we look at this picture compared to this picture, we see that these are all fatter, right? So what these blue dots are, are essentially these chemicals over here, these inflammatory mediators, that are then binding to our blood vessels, our capillaries, and essentially making them dilate. So vasodilation, which increases the blood flow. Now we've got more blood flow. This is good because what we're doing is we're bringing blood to the site. We'll just consider this infection for this particular case. So we, we or a cut. So we've cut somewhere and complement has been activated and now we've got a lot of blood flow going to the system. So not only does it increase the diameter of, so now we're looking at a blood vessel that is now being responded, right? So this is normal size where this cell is really too big to get out. It's holding all the red blood cells. But on a normal, regular basis, certainly your, uh, your blood vessels, your capillaries are leaking interstitial fluid out, and that's what forms the lymph, okay? So however, when we have inflammation, we have an increased in dilation, right? So we've got dilation, so we've got an increase there. Plus we've got these interstitial spaces. So what happens is, as this got bigger, right, the cells themselves stayed the same size. So if you're gonna blow this up like a balloon, then something's gotta give. If these cells don't stretch, then ah, the spaces between them will physically open up to the point where you can get a lot of liquids, a lot more fluid, a lot of antimicrobial chemicals. We talked about some antimicrobial peptides, plus this monocyte now, which normally would not have been able to get out, this is now big enough so that it squeezes through this interstitial space through the process called diapedesis, which I've used in this lecture. It squeezes out, and what do you suppose it's gonna do once it gets into the area and, in and encounters a pathogen, right? So if, for example, right here, what we've got is a uh, bacterium not drawn to scale, uh, but why don't I go ahead and draw it at least perhaps a little bit to scale. So if this is the bacterium right here, right, then what we've got is essentially this monocyte can go out, it starts out like this, but then it turns into a macrophage. And so a macrophage is a type of phagocyte, right? And so basically it is then gonna engulf this, it's gonna put it into a phagosome, then make a phagolysosome, degrade that, and essentially uh, eliminate what's left over. So that is the monocyte becoming the Incredible Hulk, and in this case, uh, it turned into a macrophage. Right? So, boy, you know, I love these processes, and it's just, it's, I, I, don't know, I just find it very fascinating, right? So, so basically, that's what the monocyte is gonna do at that point. So, okay, so why, what is so important about histamine then? Well, we know that histamine was produced by basophils, in this case, in response to the complement. These inflammatory mediators, histamine, binds to the capillaries, causing them to dilate. When they dilate here, it opens up these interstitial fluids. So not only do we have a lot more blood flowing through, but now a lot more stuff can come out, right? And when it comes out, Essentially, the monocytes turn into macrophage and eat up any pathogens, but also antimicrobial peptides, uh, platelets, clotting factors, everything else will get there. And this is a micrograph actually showing, check this out, a neutrophil squeezing through. Oh, it's actually caught in the act. And so that's what we're seeing up there. So pretty crazy, pretty crazy stuff. Okay, so let's kind of tie all this together. And so basically, uh, I've just been cut, oh man. And what I've just been cut on has a lot of bacteria, okay? So, so it now has the portal of entry. And so this right here, the bacteria are now invaded. Damaged cells, even before complement happens, release prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and histamine. The complement system will get activated, causing more histamine to be produced by basophils, right? So now the green areas are showing all these chemicals that are essentially causing the inflammatory response. 
What is the inflammatory response? Well, look at the diameter of the capillaries here. They just got fatter, right? And that is because the inflammatory mediators cause them to dilate. And we know that when that happens, we know that we're gonna get the interstitial spaces bigger. And so we'll have diapedesis going through where uh, neutrophils, now here we focus on monocytes, but so monocytes will go through, will get into the area, and they'll turn into macrophage. But also remember, what is the main leukocyte in the bloodstream? It's neutrophils, 60 to 70%. So they're just gonna be physically just flooding out, right? Neutrophils, monocytes, they're just gonna be going out. And what I mean by flooding, I mean, yes, diapedesing, so neutrophils and monocytes are going out, going all out into this area. And we know that neutrophils do a variety of things. They produce nets, they produce bleaches, they have phagocytose, okay? And so there are also other antimicrobial chemicals and clotting proteins to go ahead and stop any kind of bleeding. Uh, but what also happens is the swelling occurs due to the chemicals that are produced, and this swelling physically puts pressure on the nerve endings, and that's why you've got pain from even a small cut. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, so then you got a blood clot that forms. Oops, excuse me. We have a blood clot that forms. Uh, the bacteria are still being cleared out as much as possible. Uh, we have dying cells, your own cells, and that's what forms pus uh, because your cells can only do so much and then they die. Uh, and then what happens is stem cells will then uh, repair any damaged tissue. Uh, you know, there are exceptions, for example, a heart tissue, uh, this scars because it does not have stem cells, but others will, which is why you can, you know, go ahead and seal up your, your, your skin very well. And so, so that is essentially a nice tie together, hopefully, of a lot of what we just talked about in the context of what happens when you get cut and there's bacteria there. So for a lot of these processes to work the best, elevated temperature happens. And so there are uh, molecules that we produce called pyrogens. And so pyrogens increase the temperature. It can be a localized area, like the cut, right? So when you get a cut and you have inflammation and it feels warm to the touch, that's your body doing its thing. It has produced pyrogens. So why does this localized area, why do you want that to increase higher than 37 degrees Celsius? Well, a lot of your immune system works better at a higher temperature. And it evolved that way because to control it, basically. So if we compare that to then fever, we can just talk about the why it's important to have a body temperature over 37 degrees Celsius, whether it's localized at a cut or because you're running a fever because you have some type of infection. First of all, some bacteria cannot grow very well uh, at degrees higher than that. So if their optimal temperature is 37 degrees Celsius and you're running a temperature at 39, then these bacteria will grow much more slowly, giving your body time to respond and clear out the infection. During that time, what we'll see is that the temperature actually increases phagocyte and interferon activity. In other words, interferons physically work better with increased temperature. Phagocytes work better at over 37 degrees temperature. Some of your adaptive immunity, which will be covered in a different section, work better at a higher temperature. So your fever and tissue repair better at higher than 37 degrees. So your fever is your body's mechanism to essentially make all of this work a lot better, which is why when somebody breaks a fever and your temperature goes back down to 37 degrees, breaking your fever means that typically you're, you're starting to heal yourself and you've cleared out the majority of the infection. So tie in breaking a fever with this material. Okay, and so that's the word I wrote before, pyrogens. So pyrogens, um, how do they form? Well, some of them are antibody and antigen complexes or pyrogens. Some are actually toxins that bacteria produce or when a bacteria is destroyed. So remember that when we have essentially a bacterium, okay, 
So here's the bacterium. If you have a, one of your cells producing bleach and it then destroys this bacterium, well, this bacterium then is essentially going to be broken up, right? And there's going to be a whole lot of material that has been released because it is just breaking down. And so this material right here sometimes will act as a pyrogen, and that's what we're talking about right there. Okay, so, so this right here, there's a lot of different types of pyrogens. Key thing to know is that they can come from the pathogens themselves being broken down, and that essentially they increase the body's core temperature. And the reason that's important is for all of this that we just talked about. So that is why a fever is important. So that wraps up innate immunity, right? So in this particular video, we talked about the second line of defense. We talked about the different leukocytes, right? The key leukocyte that there's, there's the majority of that produces bleach, that produces nets, and phagocytosis is, of course, the neutrophil, right? Uh, we talked about the various leukocytes, the eosinophils, the monocytes, the neutrophils. We talked about the monocytes convert into macrophage, rawr, and they will eat physically phagocytose, other uh, phagocytose pathogens. Uh, we talked about how the complement cascade is activated by three ways, right? And that once it's activated, the rest of the complement pathway is the same. And these are complement proteins binding to other complement proteins, breaking them into pieces. Some of those pieces combine to form new enzymes, which will then break other pieces. And all these broken pieces aren't really broken in that they don't work. They are now activated to have these new functions. Some will form as obstinins, which means that they will bind onto pathogens. And they're like little handles for one of your, your, your phagocytes to come across and recognize the obstinin, bind to it, engulf it, and phagocytose. Other complement proteins that are the fragments will then, uh, let's see, they will bind to basophils and stimulate the basophil to produce histamine. Histamine then is an inflammatory molecule which will do a variety of things such as dilate the, red, uh, the capillaries. When it dilates, it causes those, and if we look at the, finger, the space between my fingers, when it dilates, it increases the interstitial spaces, which means that cells can come out, they can diapodes through, diapodes through, as well as clotting factors and other things will go through. And essentially, now you've got a bunch of cells, you've got a bunch of chemicals, complement is happening. If there's viruses there, interferons will be being produced. All of the stuff we've talked about so far is happening at that wound where there's bacteria or viruses or whatever it's in there. So for this module, for both the, the, the first line of defense and the second line of defense, know the nuts and bolts, right? And that is the individual components, know how they work, but then also put them together in the context of these last few uh, uh, slides talking about inflammation. And you know, when I think about all of these molecules and all of these cells, I think about it on a grand scale. I don't think about them as some weird abstract tiny things that I can't see. I think about them like, like I'm a cell and I'm going around and I'm doing this. And so if you're not already thinking in those terms, bring it a little bit more to life, right? And for these lectures, so you've been following along, you've been taking notes, ideally you, 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 you've printed out lecture slide sets and you're writing notes when you're doing it, right? And so uh, that's key. After this, quiz yourself on it. Go through, write things down. Don't just absorb. As always, be an active learner. So I really hope that you find this material fascinating and I hope that, that it's engaging and that you really get down a lot of these specifics and that you can talk about inflammation uh, to other people. Explain this to other people and try to get them excited about it. Uh, so that's that. Enjoy.